Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 18, reading to verse 25. The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, she's ugly. No, and Adam said, (laughs) just seeing if you're listening. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. They were both naked. The man and his wife were not ashamed. I want to just lay a foundation, just bottom line foundation so the other man can build on, on this foundation and uh, give to us some insights and things that the Lord gives to us that I'm certain are going to be of benefit to us. So I'm just going to give a very basic, very basic uh, Bible study as I, as I introduce our uh, conference today. Somebody once said, the most difficult years of marriage are those following the wedding. (laughs) It's probably true to some degree. But as we look at this topic today, uh, we need to begin by simply stating the obvious. I I must first say that marriage throughout the world is being redefined. In our own nation, many of our leaders have rejected the concept of what at one time was referred to as the traditional family. Uh, There was a time when family was defined simply as a husband, a wife, raising children, born to them as a married couple. But today, what is being offered in its place is a new definition that does not necessarily include the word marriage. Today, to be a family only requires people caring about one another, and they don't even need to live in the same house. And sometimes they'll have children together. And though they're not living together, they're not married, they have children, they begin to refer to themselves as a family. Well, marriage and its meaning and its importance has obviously steadily eroded over the last generation. There are many reasons for that, but I'll mention what would seem to be the most obvious. The fact, and the simple fact is, is that divorce has produced millions of single parent homes. So millions of children are being raised in a single parent home and those children are growing up without valuing marriage. It doesn't have the same meaning to them as it does for those who are raised with two biological parents. And so how can they value what they themselves have never experienced? Now there are Christians who have found themselves in that situation. There's no condemnation to them. We do not want to condemn or come off in any way as condemning to the single parents who are doing their best to raise their kids properly. Yet I'm sure that we would all agree that the ideal situation is a husband and a wife loving one another, living together, and raising their children together. Now the breakdown of marriage has affected the nation that we live in, and its value is questioned among our youth. And common cultural wisdom has affected the younger generation's perception of morality. Even those calling themselves Christians have become confused over these issues. Same-sex unions are constantly and forcefully presented as equal to heterosexual relationships. This arrangement has gained the backing of modern psychology as well as the courts of law. Legalized homosexual marriage exists internationally as well as nationally. And at this time in the United States, there are some 17 states that have legalized same-sex marriage. What's interesting about that is six states have done so by court decisions, including California, eight by state legislature, and only three by popular vote. Thirty-three states still have same-sex marriage bans, 
but the tide is turning in this battle. What is occurring is a redefinition, a redefinition of marriage. And what happens is marriage is now being reduced to something. It's being reduced to what would be called a civil matter. Homosexual unions are being presented as equal to the male and female marriage relationship. And through enactment of law, it's becoming recognized as morally equal. The activists know that the average American's morals are determined not by scripture, not by cultural tradition, but the average American's morals are determined by the things that are legal. And so the sad fact is that under normal debate, certain things are never really brought up concerning the differences between a heterosexual and a homosexual union. For example, homosexuals as a group have significantly higher levels of promiscuity, of suicide, domestic violence, and relational instability in comparison to heterosexual relationships. That's never brought up. And so what we need to do is we need to be a voice for what God has stated in his word is marriage. And what we do is we speak from a Christian perspective. So we can ask the question, what is a Christian marriage? What is marriage and what is a Christian marriage? And so at this point, I'll give a simple definition. A Christian marriage is a total commitment of one man and one woman to the person of Jesus and to one another. It is a commitment in which there is no holding back of anything. Marriage is the refining process that God uses to have us develop into the person he wants us to become. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And so we together sharpen one another. And it's the refining process that God uses to help that to be so. As you read the book of Genesis, within the first nine chapters, there are three institutions that are basic to civilization that are created. You have the creation of the church, human government, and you have marriage. And so what we'll be looking at, obviously, is an introduction to marriage. Now begin with me in verse 18 and note how it says here that God says, it's not good that the man should be alone, I will make him a helper. You get into chapter 1 of Genesis. You move on into chapter 2. And as you're reading, you note that when God began to create all things, God created them and said, he pronounced all these things good. The first thing that you find in Scripture that God ever states is not good is when he says it is not good that the man should be alone. God had determined from creation that man should have a mate and that that mate should be a woman. It isn't good that the man should be alone, so I will, I will make a helper comparable to him. And so it is not good that man should be alone. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 11 says it like this. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? So God intends for us to have somebody in our life that is an encouragement and, as the scripture says, a helper that is comparable to us. Now, in a sense, the man was not yet complete. It's been said, Man is incomplete until he marries. Then he's finished. <laughs> and that's true. <laughs> but when it says he made Adam a helper, that the word helper that we use is actually a, a, a weak word. It doesn't really express what the, what the original language, what the Hebrew actually says. The word weak there is the word ezer. And it speaks of active intervention on behalf of someone else, especially in a military context. Uh, in Deuteronomy 33, 7, for example, it says, Hear, O Lord, the voice of Judah, restore him to his people, though his own hands strive for him, help him. In other words, be with him against his foes. Intervene on his behalf. And so Eve was to be a counterpart to him, actively intervening on his behalf in the wars of life. So the basic thing that we can get at this verse first is this. One, even when you have a relationship with the Lord, it's possible to have an aloneness. We're created for fellowship with God and we're created for fellowship with other people. And marriage is intended to fulfill our need to love others and be loved by someone else. Second, marriage is God's idea. It's not man's invention. 
intended to license and enslave women, though that not that bad an idea. God said it's not good that man should be alone, and God said, I will make him a helper. So we didn't invent it, it's from God. And what's interesting to me about all of that is God knew Adam's need before Adam even realized that he had such a need. God's aware of what we need before we're even aware of it. It's like what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 8, your father knows what things you have need of before you ask. And so God was well aware in his creation what he intended to do and was well aware of it before Adam even had a thought about it. And God intended for, for marriage to bring something into the life of Adam that was lacking. It was intended to bring joy and satisfaction. Now, obviously, we've, we've all heard this story of the woman who awoke during the night and she found her husband was no longer in bed and so she put on her robe, she went downstairs and there he was sitting at the kitchen table and he had a cup of coffee in front of him and so he was in deep thought and just staring at a wall and she saw him as he began to wipe a tear from his eye and was taking a sip of his coffee. She said to him, honey, what's the matter? What are you doing down here at this time of night? And he said, well, you remember 20 years ago when we were dating and you were only 16? And she said, yeah, I do. You remember how your father caught us in the back of the car? Yeah. Do you remember how he shoved that shotgun in my face and said, either you marry my daughter or spend 20 years in jail? <laughs> yes, I do. And he wipes away another tear and he says, you know, I'd have gotten out today. <laughs> That's an old joke. You guys still laugh. So what did God do? God gave Adam a helper in the car. <laughs> no, God gave him a helper. Now, Eve was given to Adam as a gift. But it's not one of those gifts that you exchange to get what you really wanted. You don't re-gift your wife. You know, because even such great gifts sometimes may be a bit difficult. That doesn't mean we get rid of them. Again, it reminds me of a story of a couple that was driving down a country road and they were angry one with one another. They weren't talking at all. They were arguing. Neither wanted to concede their position. So they pass a barnyard of mules and pigs. And the husband looks at his wife and says, relatives of yours? <laughs> she says, yeah, they're my in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eve was supposed to be a helper, a helper comparable to him. Now, we need to remember, it says comparable. She was not less. She wasn't any better. She was just different. And she was intended to correspond to his exact need. So that gives us insight. The mate that we have, though there are the majority of the things we have in unity, that's what brought us together and keeps us together. But there are other things that actually they bring into the mix that fill in the gaps that we have in our lives and complete us. I've noticed that to be true in marriage. God seems to match us up with people who can fill those gaps. You may be a person who is habitually late. You will be the last person up in the rapture. <laughs> you have one more thing to do when you hear that trumpet. Yes, sir. I'll be right there, Lord. But you marry somebody punctual. Some of you got in a fight this morning. You knew you were supposed to be here at a certain time, and the other one had one last thing to do. They were putting on their makeup, right? And you said to the husband, honey, you can put your makeup on when you get there. So. Late, punctual. Some people are very messy. Everything has its place, and the place is the floor. But you have other people who are just, you know, they're going to pick up all of your mess. They're clean. Some people are very, very loud. You go to a restaurant and you can hear them. They're loud. And then there's the other person who's really quiet, and it just kind of fills the gap. There are some people who are very, very generous. And then they marry Mr. Cheap. <laughs> we just have a tendency. There are the, there are the ones who are, are grouchy, 
and they seem to marry the ones who are cheerful. Somebody asked the question, do you wake up grumpy in the morning? And the answer is no, I let her sleep. <laughs> so, some, some people are lazy and some people are very active. Some people are pessimists and some people are optimists. Some are very creative in everything they do and some are very static. Some are very volatile, some are very patient. It's just the way it is. And we have a tendency of filling in our gaps. And that's what Eve was going to do with Adam. She was going to complete him. Now, notice how it says in verses 19 and 20 that the Lord formed every beast of the field, etc. And that gave to Adam an opportunity to realize something, to realize that he's alone. So the survey of animals in pairs brought to the surface his natural longing, something that was already there for a mate. And so what does the Lord do? Verse 21 says, the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. So God intervenes, God takes an initiative and he does so on behalf of man, he does it for Adam. And it says here he caused Adam to go to sleep. And so if we graciously rest in God, God will graciously work for us and work all that for our good, going to sleep. And it says, in verse 22, the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into woman. That word made, it's a very powerful word. It actually contains what would be called an architectural element. The word is built or fashioned. And so God actually fashioned this woman precisely for him. I was reading how God did not take the woman from the man's feet to be trampled upon and enslaved, or from his head, that she should dominate him, but from his side, to be his companion from beneath his arm, to receive his protection, and from near his heart, to have his love and affection. And what the Lord did is he brought her to the man. Now, notice with me that the man did not have to go looking for the woman, but God brought the woman to him. And what's very interesting is when we have our wedding ceremonies, I as a minister will be standing up here and I'll ask the question, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And the father of the bride normally will say, her mother and I do. That tradition came from this passage here because God is the one who brought as a father his daughter to Adam. And so God brought the woman to the man. We have some in the room right now who are, are single, unmarried. I can tell because you're still happy. <laughs> and you're smiling. You weren't forced to come. I got, when I was born, a long time ago now, uh, I wanted to get married, I think, from s very early in my life. I think I proposed to the nurse that was attending my birth. I, I wanted to get married. And so, as a young man growing up, a young boy growing to a young man, um, I was the kind of guy that if I began to date somebody, that I, I was certain that this was going to be my bride. The first woman I ever asked to marry me was named Bernadette Archuleta. She was four years old, and I was, five, I was four. We were both four years old. So I wanted to get married from at least the age of four. So by the time I went to high school and started meeting young ladies, I began to wonder, is this the one? Is this the one? And so what the Lord did in my life is he allowed a natural longing to exist, but my problem was is I was too anxious. So it would seem that I would get an attachment that was stronger than was normal. I'd want to be married and all, and it never really worked out. And so now I'm saved at the age of 20. And now I'm thinking for sure I'm going to get married because I've got God on my side and he says, if there's anything that I desire, I should ask, and he will give it. So I go to Bible study, and here she comes, Miss Lovely. 
And I would say, in Jesus' name, that one's mine. I claim her in the mighty name of God. They didn't like me, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have any dates. A friend of mine named George Adams was speaking to me on one occasion and said to me that he had prayed a prayer. He had said, he was reading his Bible, and the Bible says that Adam went to sleep, and God brought to him his wife. And George said, I prayed that prayer. So I went home, and I thought, that's a good prayer, because I'm obviously too anxious. And so I began to pray that prayer. And when I prayed, God, in Jesus' name, may I fall asleep to my desires. And may I delight myself in you. For your word says, if I delight myself in you, you will give me the desire of my heart. The desire of my heart really ought to be to delight myself in him. But I applied that to the other things that he had promised me in the word, which would be, one would include the fact that one day I would be married. And I said to him, would you allow me to be asleep to my desires? I am tired of, of, of looking at this woman thinking, oh, maybe she's the one. Maybe this one's the one. You see? And I said, Father, in Jesus' name, put me asleep to my desires. And so my brother got saved in August, August 4th. He needed to be a disciple, and I began to teach him Bible studies. And so I began to teach him Bible studies. And one day, a young lady came walking into that Bible study. And as she walked into that Bible study, as I was teaching my brother, there was a sense in my heart that this was the one that the Lord was going to bring to me. I didn't act on that. She didn't fit the bill. You see, I'd, I'd been praying for a blonde, blue-eyed, and this one had been kept in the oven a little bit longer. <laughs> and I spoke to this young woman after the Bible study. And uh, the first thing she asked me is, what is your sign? She was going to college. And that was the cool thing at that time, horoscope and this and that. She says, what's your sign? I said, the fish. <laughs> and she said, oh, you're a Pisces. And I said, no, ichthus. I'm a Christian. I don't believe in horoscope and that stupid stuff. <laughs> I've always had a genteel way about me, a lot of manners. <laughs> and so we began to speak, and I asked her, when did you become a Christian? She says, oh, I've been a Christian all my life. So she lied to me too. <laughs> Horoscopes and lying, that's not a good combination. But as we were speaking, there was something about her. And so I drove home. I was living in Norwalk. I drove home with my sister Madeline. And, and I turned to Madeline and I said, I just met my wife. I just met my wife. She was unsaved. No, I did not date her as an unsaved woman. Because two weeks later, I think two or three weeks later, she gave her heart to Christ. And she needed discipling so badly. <laughs> that shows you my heart. <laughs> that I began discipling her and have been with her for now 30-some years. And that's what the Lord does. <laughs> so the unmarried... Instead of running around looking on eHarmony <laughs> and coming to church and looking around, maybe that's the one. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desire of your heart. I used to tell my kids, prepare yourself the best that you can because the best person that you can be is the best gift you can give to your wife or your husband. Be the best man for the Lord or the best woman for Jesus. And it works together because... A man who wants to have a great wife is going to be looking for a godly woman, be that godly woman. So seek him first in his kingdom. All these things shall be added unto you. Seek him first and watch what God will do in your life. And God brought this woman to Adam and God had fashioned her for him. 
And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. The first human is given reported speech for the first time only when there's another human to whom to respond. The speech takes the form of a verse. What is called is a naming poem. Adam asked God, why did you make Eve so beautiful? God replied, because I wanted you to love her. Adam said, why didn't you make her a little smarter? God replied, I wanted her to love you. <laughs> so, Adam's response is one of gratitude. First love is always very powerful, and therefore he breaks into song. And he, he sings three things. This song has three ingredients. One, a full awareness of woman's derivation from man. She's like me. She's flesh of my flesh. Secondly, he recognizes his authority because he named her. And thirdly, he recognizes her kinship. She's from me. And he sings this beautiful song to this woman that God had brought. And then we have the addendum. Therefore, verse 24, a man shall leave his father, mother, and be joined to his wife. That they shall become one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife. They were not ashamed. And so, this is interesting, and I'll close with this, but a man shall leave his father and mother. One of the greatest problems in marriage is the failure of leaving one's parents. Parents are no longer to be the controller of the lives of their children when they get married. In surveys, it's been asked, who has the most difficult time with in-laws? And uh, the respondents normally will be... From the woman's perspective, the woman will say, I have great problems with my mother-in-law. And uh, that's, that can be a general truth, at least those who responded. You know, because, let's face it, you know, the young man was used to certain things, and mama knows best, and now he's married to this young woman, this hussy who stole her baby, and, <laughs> oh, no, he doesn't like his food cooked like that, and, oh, he doesn't like the house cleaned like that. And mama doesn't mean badly by it, it's just that she's intervening. And the young woman, um, you know, is just constantly being taught by the mother-in-law to make things just right for the, for the baby. You know, um, Marie and I lived a year with our family as we saved money to buy a house. And for that year, she never complained. My wife never said a thing to me. And 20-some years later, she finally told me, that was tough. <laughs> and I said, you're kidding me. She said, no, it was tough. Your mom, man, every day, I didn't, didn't bathe the baby right. I didn't, I didn't do things right every day I heard that. I said, well, you, you know, mommy was right. You know? <laughs> so you'll have real problems in marriage. You have to separate. It's not necessarily like when my kids get married, I'm not necessarily becoming the, the, the child who's not born to me. I'm not becoming their new father in reality. What I am is to step back and let them see me as what they want me to be. But I'm not to impose myself on them. I'm to let them be what they are supposed to be, a new family having a new life together. My responsibility ended when they got married. And now they go off and do what the Lord would have them to do. And a man is to leave his father and mother and cling unto his wife. He's to cleave to her. The word cleave speaks of being cemented. They're supposed to be glued together. It's supposed to be the two that become the one. It's like two pieces of plywood that have glue that are pressed together, and the two now become the one. But if you try and drive a wedge between those two pieces and pull them apart, the damage is on the inside. It destroys from inside. And so I is called by God to step away from my family to cling to my wife, Marie. And that's why our marriage, one of the reasons our marriage has been blessed by the Lord. Marie and I got together early in our marriage and we made an agreement. We will never say to one another, 
I'm going to divorce you. She said, I'm going to kill you a few times, but she's never said, <laughs> I'm going to divorce you. And so they were naked. Now, obviously, that's more than mere nudity. They were naked before one another. They were open. They were emotionally, physically, and spiritually open to one another. They were close to one another. They laughed with one another, talked to one another, fellowshiped with one another, and they loved one another. It's been said those who have no sin in their conscience might well have no shame in their faces, though they have no clothes on their backs. And the two became one, and they were a perfect couple in the original perfect marriage. And then they had kids. Perfect couple, perfect marriage, perfect relationship. God wants to do a work in us today to bring that sense of love and unity and oneness. He wants to do that today. And I pray that he accomplishes that in us as we go through the rest of our teachings. Let's pray.